Hello and a very warm welcome to our very first online seminar on the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. This is the first of a series of online seminars exploring different themes covered by the Convention. My name is Gemma Neville, I'm the Outreach Coordinator at the Scottish Human Rights Commission. Um, please do introduce yourself um, and where, where you're joining as we want to know where you're, you're, you're joining us from, as many of you already have done in the text box, which is great to see. We've, I've seen messages from, from Norma and from Paul and Laura, so welcome to you all. Um, and, and please do ask questions and make comments in that text box space as we want today to be very discursive. And where we don't manage to cover things in the seminar, we'll try to respond to your questions or comments after the event. This is a live broadcast, but everything is being recorded. So if you have to leave early, don't worry, you can catch up at another occasion. Um, we're also having palantyping subtitles. Um, so uh, a welcome to our palantypists. Um, and you should be able to see text along the bottom of your screen. Um, if you are a Twitter user, <coughs> you are invited to tweet about today's event. The hashtag is CRPD Seminar. Um, so I think without further ado, I'll hand over to my colleague, who is Duncan Wilson, Head of Strategy and Legal at the Commission. And then we'll be joined by Pauline Nolan from Inclusion Scotland, who's going to speak about their work um, on today's seminar topic, which is rights in a recession. That's great. Thanks, Gemma. And good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome from me too to this first in a series of seminars on the United Nations Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. Uh, today's topic is um, rights in a recession and before I hand over to uh, Pauline who's kindly joined us from Inclusion Scotland I'll just say a little bit to introduce the convention and some of the human rights that are relevant to, to, to today's topic. So the UN Disability Convention is an international law that has been signed and ratified by the United Kingdom. That means it's legally binding on the UK, on all of the UK, including um, on Scotland. Um, it's one of the newest uh, international human rights treaties. It's often said that it doesn't create new rights, but what it definitely does do is spell out in a lot more detail exactly what's required by the UK, by Scotland and by uh, all of the state, as it were, to, to make disabled people's rights real. Uh, in one sense, it's about guaranteeing what are called the general principles in the Convention, autonomy, uh, dignity, uh, non-discrimination, participation, uh, making sure that disabled people really do have the same rights as everyone else. You'll excuse me while I queue up the, the next slide. So, um, firstly, one of the uh, uh, aspects of the Convention which is different from some other human rights treaties is that it spells out very clearly how uh, the state should uh, make those rights real. And in, to, in order to ensure that it does that, uh, there are roles for what are called independent mechanisms, which the Scottish Human Rights Commission and the Equality and Human Rights Commission together play in Scotland. Our roles are to promote, protect and monitor the implementation of the Convention. So to promote the Convention we hold uh, events like this, uh, participation events which I know a number of you will have joined in uh, earlier this year and last year, to raise awareness of the Convention and um, to help explain what it means and to really get a sense from disabled people across the country on what the human rights issues are that you have. We also act to protect uh, the Convention and to monitor it. And crucially, we're uh, gathering evidence to submit to the United Nations Committee on the Disability Convention when it will review the UK uh, in a couple of years' time.
Disabled people are at the heart of the convention, of course, and because uh, disabled people played such a role in shaping the convention, the convention is very clear that nothing should happen without the involvement of disabled people. The slogan uh, that you will all be familiar with, nothing about us without us, has really informed exactly how the convention uh, should work. Um, I'll be uh, explaining a little bit more about how that, how that should work in relation to the, today's topic. And the next slide um, focuses on the first of the key human rights principles which should inform any uh, decision on budget uh, allocation. Um, we're in an a economic recession at the moment, as we all know, where uh, decisions on budget are at the cutting edge of the impact on disabled people's rights. You have the right to take part in all decisions that affect your rights. That's spelled out very clearly in the Convention. So the government and public authorities should be including the voice of disabled people in making those difficult uh, budget decisions. That's also reinforced in the Human Rights Act and the, the European Convention on Human Rights, which uh, lies behind it. So that right is also enforceable in our domestic courts. Accountability. And the Convention is also very clear, not only that disabled people should be involved in decisions, but that the state and then public authorities too have to take account of the impact any decision will have on disabled people. That means, in effect, uh, public authorities should be able to demonstrate how they have assessed the impact of decisions, including budget decisions, on disabled people. So the use of human rights as well as a quality impact assessment can be a key vehicle for showing accountability. It also means that uh, you should have the ability to challenge decisions where they need to be challenged, whether through complaints procedures or in the courts um, ultimately. And accountability should mean monitoring the impact over time, so developing indicators with disabled people to track how decisions are actually impacting on your rights. Uh, Non-discrimination and uh, equality I think is uh, very familiar to um, all of us. Uh, we now have the Equality Act of course which introduces a general duty uh, to pay due regard uh, to the need to advance equality of opportunity for disabled people in all decisions. That also is something that you can enforce in the courts, in our domestic courts, if you feel that's not happening in practice. Um, but also, more broadly, uh, the uh, Disability Convention and the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights means that the state should be prioritising uh, those in the most marginal situations in its budget decisions. So rather than paying the heaviest price, the state should be prioritising uh, the rights of the most marginalised, even where resources are limited. And we can discuss whether that's happening in practice. Being involved uh, is not a passive um, uh, aspect. It means that the state has to support people with disabilities physical disabilities, mental disorders and intellectual uh, disabilities support their participation, support all of our participation in decision making. So empowerment um, can, can include such things as advocacy support, uh, recognising and supporting people's legal capacity um, so that the state has to support positively all of our participation in decisions. Crucially, um, all of our human rights should be taken into account in budget decisions. Now, uh, domestically, we have the Human Rights Act, um, which includes, uh, amongst many other articles, uh, the right to uh, pro protection from degrading treatment, which is the uh, red line below which no one should be left. So any decision which would risk leaving people, for example, uh, in um, a chronic or severe neglect where uh, they are left in intolerable conditions, that really is an absolute red line which should never be crossed. 
So in assessing the impact of decision, the state and public authorities should be looking at whether anyone may be left uh, below that threshold. And if that's the case, they should think again. That decision should simply not be made. Many decisions will not be as severe as that, but they will nonetheless impact on our ability to uh, determine our own futures, self-determination, autonomy, to live the life we choose in community. That right is protected in Article 8 of the Human Rights Act. It's not an absolute right. It's what's called a qualified right. So where that right is engaged, the uh, public authorities should be looking at whether the impact on anyone is proportionate. So anyone who is suffering disproportionately uh, may have a claim uh, that their Article 8 right has not been upheld. In addition to the rights that we're familiar with in the Human Rights Act, we also have what are known as economic, social and cultural rights, like the right to adequate housing and the right to the highest attainable standard of health. Now, those are not yet protected in our domestic laws, but they're still international human rights that we all have and that the UK has signed up to respect, to protect and to fulfil. To do that, it should be ensuring that any um, decision it makes which has a, 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 an effect of reducing the realisation of those rights is very carefully justified as necessary <clears throat> based on the full range of human rights. It should also be able to show that its budget allocation prioritises those in the worst or most marginal situations and that it ensures at the very least minimum essential levels of all of those rights to um, everyone. Um, one uh, way in which all of this can be better achieved is through what I mentioned before, human rights impact assessment. And what Pauline will talk about in a moment shows a variety of ways in which disabled people's human rights can be impacted by decision making. And crucially, the state should be thinking about not just the impact of one discrete decision, but the cumulative impact of a range of decisions. And it is often at that point that people really begin to feel an impact uh, of the state's budget decisions on the realization or, or non-realization of their human rights. So we need to be thinking very carefully about how we assess that cumulative impact. Okay, so that's a general framing of the human rights issues. And uh, I'll now hand over to uh, Pauline Nolan. Dr. Pauline Nolan's joined us from Inclusion Scotland, and she's going to talk about some of their concerns uh, on the human rights of disabled people in the current economic climate. Um, over to you, Pauline, and I'll help with these slides okay. if that helps. Thank you very much, Duncan. Um, and good afternoon. Um, Thank you very much to the Scottish Human Rights Commission and to the Equality and Human Rights Commission for allowing me to discuss these issues, present to you on this very important subject this afternoon. Um, <coughs> and um, very pleased to see that some of Inclusion Scotland members are taking part in this today. Um, another good reason for, for presenting just at this time as well is that we have our first Disability History Month this month in Scotland which has covered um, the 1st of December, which was World AIDS Day, the 3rd of December, which was International Day for Disabled People, and just last Saturday was Human Rights Day. So just, thanks. Um, so just to introduce the topic, the recession disabled people in Scotland. So the recession started in 2008, but we're feeling the effects now. And to give you some background, only half of disabled people are at, of working age are actually in work and that's compared to with over 70% of non-disabled people. They're less likely to be in work and more likely to be on benefits and Leonard Cheshire Foundation has found that disabled people have 25% higher living costs than non-disabled people. So that'll give you a bit of context. Um, Disabled people are, are facing a triple whammy, as you can see on the slide, 
in terms of fits, fiscal cuts that have made, been made in response to the crisis, and these are disproportionately affecting disabled people. Um, these include cuts to essential benefits, cuts to services, and an increase in charges. Um, we have rights under the UN Convention to income, to a, an adequate income, to mobility, to independent living, and to participation in, to, in society. And we believe that these cuts amount to a calculated attack on disabled people, um, who because of their physical, sensory, and learning impairments are more isolated and thus less able to defend themselves than, the, than other sections of society. So I'll just introduce you to Inclusion Scotland in case you're not aware of um, our organisation. We are a national network of disabled people's organisations and individual disabled people. We draw attention to the physical, social, economic and attitudinal barriers that, that, um, that affect our everyday lives as disabled people and exclude us from society. Our tagline is also nothing about us without us. We have the aim to empower disabled people to have an effective voice at policy levels, at policy making levels both in Scotland and beyond. Um, and to tell you a little bit about our recent activities in terms of the convention, we, um, Inclusion Scotland, we responded to a consultation from the UK government on their own report on how they were um, performing under the convention and we had Inclusion Scotland members take part in consulting on that. We consulted our members, we got their views. Um, as part of the Scottish um, campaign for a fair society, we submitted a, a report to the UN Council on Human Rights on the UK's performance and we did particularly emphasise the, the, the economic cuts and how they'll impact on the rights of disabled people. Um, but we also, we also looked at other examples in that submission, so there are things like, there are issues in the UK such as access to education in, for disabled people, for example for, um, for young people who are making transition at the age of 18, um, the Independent Living Fund has been closed to new applicants so that might impact on your decision to go to college and have an education and um, therefore impact on your employability. Um, disabled children are being denied access to mainstream education where it, it can be appropriate for them to take part in mainstream education. And other examples include accessibility of documents. So say if you're blind and you're receiving letters from your NHS telling you confidential and private information and yet you don't have access to that, you can't read them yourselves. That's, that's against your right to privacy, to private life. So in all these reports we've considered how the Welfare Reform Bill will impact on people's lives and therefore will impact on our human rights as disabled people. So looking at um, the scale of, of, of benefit cuts, um, what we know that the, the UK government have um, published that they're going to make £18 billion of savings of cuts to welfare benefits overall. Half of those they, they've um, estimated will impact on disabled people. In Scotland that translates to over £2 billion being taken out of local economies and we estimated that, uh, that at least half of that is being taken from Scottish disabled people and their families. By 2015 the total loss to disabled people, as you can see from your slide, is to, from just three welfare benefits will be £688 million annually. Time limiting contributory employment and support allowance um, to 12 months and people failing work capability assessments that have been conducted by ATOS, a private company, and losing your benefit altogether or moving on to job seekers allowance will result into annual, in annual losses of £378.6 million. The 20% reduction that the government's got behind the new the changes to disability living allowance for working age people, the personal independence payment as it's called, 
Um, the reduction in that expenditure resulting in £268 million pounds worth of, uh, of benefits. And then lot and housing benefits, £42 million pounds annually just for those people, disabled people who are living in um, social housing. And that's, that gives you that total, that's annually, cumulatively, over £2 billion, pounds, as I said before. So the cuts to benefits, which benefits are being cut, well, as I said before, <coughs> do excuse me, um, disability living allowance is being cut by 20% of the budget um, through the changes um, involved in personal independence payments. There's employment support allowance, um, a lot more cuts than were ed estimated by the DWP are actually taking place because so many more people are failing at the unfair assessment um, and it's been judged to be unfair by a recent review by Professor Harrington. Um, several, and, and then there's the uprating of benefits which they used to use the what was called the retail price index and now they're going to be using the consumer price index which is about half the value of the retail price in index and means that your benefits will be uprated annually at a lesser rate than they're currently being. People will lose a lot of money because of this. Housing benefits. Disabled people are more likely to rely on other benefits too, so housing benefits were reduced by an average of £13 a week according to the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations and that's just because of the under-occupancy penalty, so if you have one bedroom, you lose an average of £11 a week, two extra bedrooms, two additional bedrooms from the one that you stay in, that it's more. Um, we've estimated from DWP figures that this will result in over 66,000 households with disabled people needing to find additional money to pay their rent. I'll give you an example of this later. Um, and also household dependents and non-dependents are more likely to lose their benefits as well. So moving on to the next slide. Other benefits, I mentioned before that the um, independent living fund is being removed for um, new claimants. That will drastically impact on the future of human rights for young people. We know people who rely on that, that particular fund to get to work, for example. Um, the Welfare Reform Bill proposes to move automatic entitlement to the contributory <coughs> um, national insurance for children so that they've had contributions made. If they're severely disabled and when they turn 18, then the, the chances are that they're, they're unlikely to find work. The Welfare Reform Bill proposes to remove that. <coughs> and the idea of independent living through all of this cuts is being removed entirely really if you think about it you can't get to work because you don't get some of these payments anymore you don't have a chance for employment and um, people are also facing additional charges for the services that they use so for example for care services Yeah. So how will this affect disabled people and their human rights? Without this income that benefits bring, disabled people will lose access to their communities, to their social and to their family life, key rights within the Convention. They'll potentially lose passported benefits such as travel passes or access to the Blue Badge Scheme. They'll potentially be made homeless. There is a high risk of homelessness because of the reform to housing benefits, some of which have already taken place. And disabled people are more likely to need emergency treatment or health or social services as, as they, um, you know, if they don't receive the care that they need at the point where it might prevent worsening of their condition or impairment then this is going to lead to more expensive, more expense for the government, more expense to the NHS, really. So, I did say that I was going to talk to cu about cuts to local authority services. Um, many local authorities have been increasing the threshold of eligibility criteria, which means that you have to prove that you're more disabled. You, ha you have to have a higher level of disability to be able to qualify for care. 
and we believe this will lead to life, what we call life and limb care, so care only when it's hit emergency levels, again, rather than preventative care. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, also, councils tend to be moving towards this trend of procuring services, and as we know, the cheapest service is not always the safest, and that has an impact on the way that people experience their care service. So, for example, we've heard about adults being left on a chemical toilet for the day because there was no longer, they no longer had somebody come into their house. Um, or people being left in incontinence pads over the night. There was the case of the ballerina uh, in London who, um, who tried to sue Kensington Council and over her dignity because they were leaving in, in, her in incom incontinence pads when she could get to the toilet with some support and she was being denied her overnight care. There are other examples that we're all aware of, of neglect and, and abuse. So for example, we all know about the Panorama programme and how it highlighted abuse going on in the Winterbourne Care Home for young disabled adults. Um, also here in Scotland, there's the example of the Elsie English Care Home, which was shut down follow, following the death of one of the residents and found to be how, some, some extremely bad practice in terms of how people were being fed. So, so what this is resulting in um, is that these cuts are being made and um, the Department for, for Work and Pensions are really playing up the rates of fraud for, for, of disabled people claiming DLA and also out of work benefits for sickness such as employment support allowance. And in actual fact the rates of fraud are very, very low and both for fraud and error uh, make up less than 0.5%. Yet they've been putting out press releases and I've seen these press releases playing up the rate of fraud, not highlighting the rate of error. Um, this has resulted in some very, very negative stories in the press about disabled people. For example, stories about people getting BMWs on the motability scheme. Um, and, you know, they don't need them. Why do they need them? They're not even using crutches. This is leading to attacks and abuse on disabled people who, you know, some days you might have a good day and you might use your motability car to, um, to get out to the shops but not need your crutches or your, your wheelchair. And other days you'll have a bad day. But people are actually being attacked for this kind of thing. It's really, really very, very worrying trend. And we know that people are experiencing in an increase in harassment since some of these media stories have been out. So for example, a, a recent scope study found that almost half of respondents felt that attitudes towards them had got worse in the last year and that they experience discrimination on a daily basis or a weekly basis. And in their own inquiry towards the report Hidden in Plain Sight, the EHRC has found that disabled people are more likely, that they've come to expect harassment, to accept it, and that includes verbal and physical abuse, theft and fraud, sexual harassment, and bullying. And they accept that as inevitable and the HRC say partly because public authorities do not consistently have adequate structures in place to prevent and address harassment, um, but further ed evidence from disabled people shows that they live in fear due to lack of support because perpetrators often do not face the consequences for their actions. So I'm now going to give you a case study of an example of how the cuts will impact on one particular person and how they're already having an effect. Um, and I'd like to thank Lothian Centre for Inclusion, Inclusive Living for providing this example. So, <coughs> please excuse me. The name has been changed. Um, this is nobody that you'll recognise, but Robert is, um, is 38. Um, he's disabled. His impairment is rheumatoid arthritis and you can see on that slide some of the benefits that he receives so he gets £96.53 for, um, for his income, uh, income support for incapacity a week. DLA is, includes the low rate of care component and the high rate of mobility which, which is £70.95 a week altogether. He also gets housing benefit and council tax benefit and 
line up the next slide, and I'll tell you a bit more about him, and if you don't mind, I'll read a little, I'll refer to my notes again. Um, Robert faces additional costs due to his disability, um, with a mobility and fuel costs due to having rheumatoid arthritis. He experiences chronic pain, uses crutches to walk, and um, can only walk very short distance, meaning that he relies on taxis to travel and get around. Robert's disability living allowance allows him to pay for taxi fares for around one or two return taxi journeys per week. He lives in a ground floor, accessible, private rented flat and is unable to use stairs. He's recently been informed that his housing benefit is being cut by £10 a week and that happened earlier this year. Um, so that means that he's got £520 less per year and that he now has to found, find an additional £40 rent a month or he'll have to find an alternative place to live. He's got restricted options though, as he can either has to have ground floor or other level access accommodation. If the welfare reform bill is passed, Robert faces losing entitlement to the lower care rate of a care component of his DLA. He says that he uses this money to pay for things like additional heating costs, alternative therapies for pain relief, and food for his special diet, um, and also for specialist equipment for his home. He's also concerned that he might lose the, the mobility component of his DLA. So you've got there a total loss per year because of these potential cuts and because of the actual cut that he's experiences of £1,536.66. So it doesn't seem like that much per week, £29.55, but it's a lot if you are not in work and, and facing these additional costs. So just a final few words, um, Inclusion Scotland have been campaigning on these cuts, we've been working with the Disability Alliance in the UK and with the Scottish Campaign on Welfare Reform in Scotland in trying to get amendments made to the Welfare Reform Bill while it's at the Lord stage in the UK Parliament. We've been doing that since we heard about them, since the proposals were made. And we feel that it's really important to let people know the impact of welfare reform on their lives. So we, will, we are happy to come and give presentations to your organisation if you want that. I think it's empowering for people to know and to campaign too. Together with Capability Scotland, we've been encouraging our members to write to their member of the Scottish Parliament to tell them how the cuts will impact on them. That's because the Scottish Parliament will soon be voting on what's called a legislative consent motion, which means that they are basically granting yes to some of the more controversial aspects of welfare reform. We're asking them to say no. So far we've got quite a lot of support within the parliament on this, but we need to still put some pressure on their members of parliament. It doesn't mean that the bill won't be passed in Scotland, but it might mean that the Scottish Government can put legislation in, in place itself to mitigate some of the worst effects of the cuts on disabled people. We've also been involved in the Hardest Hit campaign. Um, they've just, they're have just just presenting a Christmas card to the Scrooges today in Parliament, in the UK Parliament. And so if you do want more information on the welfare cuts and their impact on your human rights, please get in touch with us. And also you can look at our briefings on which are on our websites and find out more about how to contact your member of Scottish Parliament. That's great. Thank you so much, Pauline. That was uh, an incredible um, overview of um, the, some of the issues uh, impacting on disabled people's human rights today. Um, uh, please do uh, submit, those of you watching online, submit your questions by the text box um, on your screens. Uh, a number of you have been doing that already, um, and we've got some questions that have come in. Gemma has been uh, carefully uh, transcribing them and, and passing them over. So I have some of them here and we'll start with a few and see how we get on. Um, one of the most recent questions that came in there uh, was from Morag Redwood at uh, SCVO. And uh, she was pointing out, of course, that the um, Equality Act duty to uh, 
um, uh, pay due regard and uh, the impact assessment um, component that can be a way of delivering that, that doesn't extend to human rights. So her question was, uh, is there any uh, other, any legal duty uh, to impact assess on human rights? Um, well, the, the, the Human Rights Act, Section 6 of the Human Rights Act includes the uh, public sector duty, um, as you might call it in equality law. Uh, it means that all public authorities and others who perform public functions, so that should extend to private uh, bodies when they're delivering public functions, they have to ensure that they comply with the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, so we as the both commissions, the Equality and Human Rights Commission and the Scottish Human Rights Commission, we're um, beginning a, a pretty significant project at the moment to develop integrated impact assessment processes so that um, public authorities across Scotland should be able to assess the impact of all of their decisions, not only on equality and non-discrimination, um, but also on human rights. Um, in addition, uh, uh, Pauline was talking on um, about the uh, Welfare Reform Bill and uh, the legislative consent motion that the Scottish Parliament is debating at the moment. Um, the Welfare Reform Bill is also being debated at the Westminster Parliament and parliaments can play a key role, both parliaments, in scrutinising draft legislation uh, to ensure that it complies with human rights. The Scottish Parliament has to do that. It is not allowed to pass any law which uh, is incompatible with the European Convention on Human Rights. If it did, it wouldn't be law. The courts would strike it out. In Westminster it's a bit different because the courts can't strike down Westminster laws uh, th under the Human Rights Act. They can declare that they are incompatible and then the Parliament has to consider how it responds to that. Um, so in addition to encouraging the various committees of the Scottish Parliament to look at the human rights uh, impact of the legislative consent motion on the Welfare Reform Bill, you can also engage with the Westminster Parliament. Just today, um, the Joint Committee on Human Rights of the Westminster Parliament issued its report on the Welfare Reform Bill and amongst other things, um, was critical of the failure by the UK government to uh, introduce a full equality and human rights impact assessment for the legislative consent motion. So um, it's certainly best practice for the bill itself, thank you. So it's certainly best practice to assess uh, on the basis of, of human rights as well. And while there isn't a process duty to do that as such, there is definitely an outcome duty to make sure that you have complied uh, with human rights. Um, so I'll, I'll start on, on some of the other questions as well and then hand over to Pauline to see whether she has uh, other things to add. Um, is the Convention part of the law of Scotland or is the Convention just a set of guidelines? Now I'm not sure who, who that's come from, uh, but um, we'll, we'll give it a shot. Um, it's quite a complex answer actually. So uh, the Convention is binding on Scotland internationally. Um, it is not a law of Scotland in the sense that you could go to the court and say my Convention, Disability Convention right has been violated unless you can draw a connection with one of the laws that we have. So for example, um, the courts should increasingly be looking to the Disability Convention to interpret the rights in the Human Rights Act. Um, and that has been the case at the European level, where the European Court of Human Rights has looked at the Disability Convention to understand what's required to realise those rights uh, through the lens, if you like, of the Disability Convention. And um, So that's one way. Another way is um, that the European Union has actually uh, ratified the Disability Convention. So that means that if any European Union directive, uh, like an equality directive, is at play, then there is uh, a duty. It should be read again through the lens of the Disability Convention. 
So there are some creative ways that haven't yet happened in Scotland where the courts could be encouraged to look at the Disability Convention as relevant to understanding other areas of our law. Um, there's quite a few questions. I'll, I'll, I'll actually pause after one more to, to give Pauline a chance to add, and then we'll, we'll take some more. Uh, the next question uh, is a good one for, for the Commission. Uh, if the UK abandons the Human Rights Act, but Scotland keeps it, how will this affect the Scottish Human Rights Commission and the Equality and Human Rights uh, Commission? So um, I'm sure you'll all have uh, followed this debate uh, at the UK level, the uh, um, coalition government has a very carefully crafted agreement uh, about uh, human rights in the coalition agreement, where previous pr prior to the election the Conservative Party was very clear it wanted, or a majority of the sort of many of the senior members wanted to to repeal or get rid of the Human Rights Act, and replace it with a British. Bill of Rights. Uh, the Liberal Democrats were very clear they wanted to keep the Human Rights Act and as a result of that the agreement that the coalition has is that they have set up a commission, a new commission, to look at the possibility of a British Bill of Rights which builds on our commitments under the European Convention but crucially it makes no commitment uh, at the moment related to the Human Rights Act. That commission will report at the end of next year on its on the options available, um, and it was in Scotland just last week um, receiving evidence, talking to the Scottish government, talking to uh, members of the Scottish Parliament, talking to civil society, and the consistent message that um, all parties really in Scotland gave back to the commission was this is not the direction that we want to go in in Scotland. Scotland is on its own human rights journey. We have human rights in the DNA of the Scottish Parliament. We have passed a range of human rights based laws on adult protection, on incapacity, um, uh, on mental health. And um, Scotland is um, currently considering developing a, a national human rights action plan to realise the broad range of, of human rights. So the direction that Scotland's going is very much looking forwards and looking internationally for inspiration. And uh, the direction that the UK is considering is a look backwards, back in history, all the way back in some cases to uh, the 13th century and the Magna Carta, um, and inwards towards Britain and our values, whereas um, we certainly hope that Scotland is, and it seems to be, moving in a forward-looking direction with respect to, to human rights, which doesn't mean that there aren't real issues, but um, hopefully uh, we can safeguard the Human Rights Act. It would be possible for the Scottish Parliament to retain um, the human rights protections in the Human Rights Act if, if the UK went in a different direction, but. Uh, let's hope that that doesn't happen because it would uh, lead to differences in, in rights in different parts of the UK. Uh, there's lots more questions, but I want to see whether Pauline has any comments on those. Yeah, am I right in thinking that that's the Scotland Act has actually got the, the European Convention running right through it, so we would be protected by that if the UK abandoned the Human Rights Act? Uh, the Scotland Act um, refers to the rights in the Human Rights Act, right, so right, um, right, which is also based on the European, European Convention. Convention. That's right. So um, that that means that the Scottish Parliament um, has to comply with the rights in the European Convention on human rights, mm -hmm. and at present that connection is drawn through the Human Rights Act. So there's a very complex constitutional issue mm -hmm. if the UK wanted to repeal the Human Rights Act, there would need to be a very careful uh, consideration of what impact that would have on devolution. It might be a deal breaker for the whole uh, idea. Yeah, um, somebody's just said that they couldn't hear me very clearly, um, so I was just asking Duncan about the Scotland Act and whether that reflects the, uh, he was saying it reflects the Human Rights Act, that's my question. 
I hope you can still see us. Um, it's a wee bit darker in here than it was a moment ago because the lights have just gone out. Um, if you can't see us, uh, do please type uh, to let us know, but we'll just carry on um, in the hope that you can. Um, shall I carry on with some of the other yeah, questions? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So there, there's a range of really, really good questions that, that have come in so far. Um, one of the next questions, um, would it be possible to bring a legal case uh, to increase uh, the budget for, uh, for the range of um, disabled people? Or uh, is it only possible to bring legal cases about individuals' uh, circumstances? I can give a quick answer to that. Um, there's the, the Disability Alliance um, has been putting together a judicial review um, to challenge the cuts as they take place. So as the Welfare Reform Bill pass, as far, is passed, as far as I'm aware, they're getting ready with a legal team to challenge this Welfare Reform Bill in general on how the cuts will impact on disabled people. That's good to know, um, and it will be something to, to watch with interest because judicial review um, is a way in which anyone can challenge a, a general policy or, or decision. Um, and uh, traditionally in Scotland it's been quite challenging to, to get um, recognised to have standing, but there's been some recent cases that might end up opening that out quite a bit, so it might end up being a bit more straightforward. Uh, to challenge that and to show that you have an interest in doing so. Um, other ways of challenging decisions, a lot of the cases which have focused on the impact of the economic cuts have actually been more from England uh, than from Scotland and they have looked primarily at um, the decision making process itself. So a case in um, Birmingham for example looked very carefully at whether a decision which ended up moving towards provision of services on what Pauline was talking about, a life and limb basis, had that decision been taken in the right way, had it properly taken into account the impact that it would have on the equal rights of um, people with disabilities and it was found that it hadn't, that the process itself had failed and so the decision had to be revisited. So that's another way in which um, a duty to conduct proper impact assessments can be upheld by the courts. Of course you can also use the convention mechanisms themselves. So the convention as a United Nations document means that uh, there is a committee uh, at the UN of independent experts who review over time whether each state is doing what it should to uphold the convention rights. So a number of organisations have, have submitted um, to the Universal Periodic Review and a lot of disabled people's organisations have done so which is tremendous and it will give a real focus on the um, rights of people with disabilities at the UN review on all of the UK's human rights obligations next year but you can also submit to the specific committee on this issue which will review the, the UK in a couple of years but finally there, in addition to the convention, there's also an optional protocol which allows individuals and groups of individuals in the UK who feel that their rights under the convention have been violated and they haven't got a remedy through the UK courts and other systems, they can then take that to the UN as an individual complaint. Um, and that, that decision wouldn't be legally binding as such, but it has political force. So that would be one other um, mechanism that you could consider. Now, let me see, what other questions do we have? Um, here's one maybe, Pauline, uh, where, where can uh, people find copies of the Disability Convention or more information about it? Um, you can find the Convention on the Rights of Disabled People on the UN website. If you put UN Enable into Google, that will take you directly to that. Um, you can also find copies of the report that the UK did in, on the Office for Disability Issues. That's within the UK Parliament website, UK Government website, sorry. And um, you can see the copy of the, the, the consultation, the report on that that we did, and that's on our website, Inclusion Scotland. Um, yeah. Great stuff. And uh, in addition, 
Um, of course, both the Equality and Human Rights Commission and the Scottish Human Rights Commission have um, quite a lot of information on the Convention on their websites. Um, so for the Scottish Human Rights Commission, for example, if you go to uh, our website, www.scottishhumanrights.com, which I think Gemma is just typing in right now, um, then there's a tab called Our Work and one called Disability Convention, and there's loads of information there. So please have a look, and if you don't find what you're looking for, get in touch and we'll, we'll try to help too. Um, have disabled people in other parts of Europe, for example Greece and Italy, used the Disability Convention to, to challenge uh, the impact of the cuts? Uh, and another question here, this one, I'm not sure who that last one was from, but this next one is from Nancy Fancott. And, and Nancy's asking, how can human rights be used to challenge local authority budget cuts on the voluntary sector care? Um, on the first uh, question, um, certainly there have been uh, a lot of um, advocacy and campaigning across Europe and um, the European Disability Forum, um, which is the uh, umbrella organisation for a lot of disabled people's organisations <laughs> um, across uh, Europe, uh, has been advocating very strongly and um, um, including at the domestic level across Europe and also at the European uh, Union level to have the Convention um, taken seriously and for um, all decisions to be uh, considered in, in the light of the Convention. Um, there have been at least two or three cases at the European Court of Human Rights where people have also used the Convention uh, to um, to challenge decisions on legal capacity, for example, um, and also on um, a failure to on of uh, Switzerland to uh, reasonable accommodation of um, disabled people in in a decision in that case about um, military service. Strange, um, and the the two decisions on on legal capacity came from Russia and Slovakia. Uh, Nancy's question, how can human rights be used to challenge local authority budget cuts on voluntary sector care? Um, so this comes to the what we were talking about a moment ago, um, the way in which a lot of decisions have been challenged increasingly in, in England, in Birmingham, in the Isle of Wight, um, in, in London as well, through the courts. Um, because local authorities have been challenged that they have failed to take into account the impact of their decisions on, um, on disabled people. Uh, that hasn't happened to the same extent in Scotland, but there is no legal reason why that shouldn't be the case. Uh, there are the same um, general duty under the Equality Act and the same duties under the Human Rights Act on uh, local authorities um, in Scotland. Um, there are other ways as well, so Coventry is a good example where um, Coventry Women's Voices um, and uh, the University of uh, Warwick uh, worked together to um, practically assess the impact of a whole series of cuts on women in Coventry. So um, that then gathered evidence as to how, as I was mentioning before, the cumulative impact of a whole series of decisions may have ended up um, impacting disproportionately on women's human rights when a whole series of benefits, for example, were cut. And it's only when you look at them in the round and, and understand the lived experience, how that impacts on real people, uh, that you can really understand the, the human rights impacts uh, in practice. Mm -hmm. So there are both legal routes and advocacy routes in mm -hmm. which human rights can be helpful. And just to add to that, um, Inclusion Scotland last week um, we launched a human rights toolkit which contains some examples and um, it contains some of the rights in the Convention, the Human Rights Act and how you can use those to affect how you can use those to effectively campaign if, if not taking a case and how you can take a case forward as well. So that's also available at our website which is www.inclusionscotland.org. Great stuff. Um, <coughs> we have probably one last, this may be the last question we have time for. 
Um, but the, there's one here asking um, whether the Scottish Government has promoted the Convention uh, in libraries, in health centres um, and so on. I don't believe that there's a publication as such that's been distributed to libraries and, and health centres, but um, the Scottish Government has uh, gone um, some way, I think it's fair to say, further than what seems to be the, the trend at the UK level uh, to um, look at the Convention, to take it seriously. They, they produced a, an 80-page report on the state of the Convention rights in Scotland, um, and they're uh, currently discussing how they will take forward uh, plans for the Convention, realisation of those rights in Scotland, alongside the um, independent living uh, strategy. And one way of doing that, which we're um, talking about with uh, to see whether this is something disabled people, uh, as well as government and public authorities, would um, be uh, interested, commit to be involved in, would be through not, not just producing a strategy at high level, but actually developing an action plan. So looking at where are the gaps in the realisation of disabled people's human rights in Scotland, and then working out, well, how will those gaps be addressed over time? Who will commit to uh, taking the action that's needed to realise those rights, and by what time? And that plan would be supported by uh, indicators so that it can be tracked and its progress can be tracked over time and it should be supported by an independent monitoring mechanism uh, in the way that we have the two human rights and equality commissions in Scotland monitoring the realisation of the convention. But would it necessarily be binding? Um, well, an action plan would be based on the binding uh, treaty, mm -hmm. um, but the, the purpose of it would really be a practical roadmap to, mm -hmm. to look at where we're failing to realise those rights and then how we can address it over time. Because a lot of, a lot of the rights in the um, Convention are economic, social and cultural rights mm -hmm. as well, which means they should be fully realised over time. Um, and it's crucial that disabled people, as well as um, authorities, are involved in shaping uh, how they can be realised over time. So that action plan would, pr would provide a way of um, participation and an objective plan by which um, progress could be achieved. It's a similar um, approach has been taken already with children's rights mm -hmm. in Scotland where we have a children's rights action plan. So this would be a way of actually um, getting the government to look at where it's failing to realise the rights and what it can do uh, and, and over what time it will commit to doing it to, to make those rights um, a reality. Okay, I think we're, we're just about wrapping up this first seminar. Um, thank you so much for, for such a rich array of questions and, and participation. Um, before we finish, I'll just hand over uh, to Gemma, who will uh, who'll wrap up and introduce the next in the series of seminars in a couple of months. Great, thank you. I really do have the, the easy bit now, don't I? Um, but I just wanted to say on behalf of both the commissions, the Scottish Human Rights Commission and the Equality and Human Rights Commission, um, thank you very much for taking part today. Um, it was the first of, of several seminars, um, so, so something of, of an unknown, but considering it was just the lights that failed us today, um, I'm, I'm very pleased. Um, and thank you very much to Dr Pauline Nolan from Inclusion Scotland for um, from your contribution and, and discussion today. Um, and, and, and I know that where questions were directed towards Inclusion Scotland, you can follow up with, with people afterwards yes, also. Yeah, I will do, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Great. Um, so everything from today has been recorded and over the next few days we will um, put those recordings up on the two commissions' websites um, so you can go back and watch or listen to aspects of it in your own time. Um, but we haven't managed to um, answer your question or um, you've got something further you'd like to add, um, please feel free to, to get back in touch um, and you can contact the Scottish Human Rights Commission by emailing hello at scottishhumanrights.com and if at any point you want to share your experiences of the systematic barriers that still remain for disabled people to access full range of rights, the barriers that the state, the government must bring down, 
then you can share that with with us at the at the, at the commissions. And um, your feedback on how we can make this format better is really important to us. So please also share that, um, and your suggestions would be really welcome. Um, and then finally, a, a plug for for the next seminar, which will take place on the sixteenth of January, and the topic for that will be getting justice. And we're delighted that somebody from the Legal Services Agency will be able to join us to bring that topic to life then in January. And I should say that, that, that all of the, the themes in this online seminar series have been chosen as a result of the, the evidence that you, disabled people, provided um, at our participation events uh, back in March. And the feedback you gave us from that was really helpful and the so-called webcasting events and we've worked with the same technical and paleontypist crew today and um, so a big thank you to all of them as well um, so have a very good afternoon um, or, or, or lunch break as well if you're if you're in an office somewhere um, and we look forward to seeing you in the new year thank you thank you thank you